I'm Chris Burton, I'm the technical project leader of the project, uh, looking after the design of the finished machine uh, and my provenance is that I was the leader of the building of the replica of the Manchester baby computer, so I've got that under my belt. Our goal is to reproduce and make a replica of the EDSAC computer and run the squares program that they ran on the 9th of May 1949. That's our goal. Now, there are objectives to, so to support that. One is that it should be an authentic working replica and not just a load of boxes with a laptop computer inside simulating it. They should be the authentic circuits that were used in 1948 and 49 and 50 uh, doing the same job that was done in the old. So it's, it is authentically replicating the functionality and the appearance so that a scholar in the future should be able to look at our replica and not be misled into saying, good heavens, they used Teflon coated cable in 1949. We want to be careful not to do anything which is out of character so that people are not misled in the future. This is uh, one of three surviving chassis from the original EDSAC. This one is kept in the computer lab in their heritage section <coughs> in Cambridge. There's another one on display in the computer gallery in the Science Museum. And there's a third one in the Computer History Museum in California, uh, which was donated to them by Morris Wilkes some years ago. Uh, this is the only one to which we have access, however. We've got uh, metal, folded metal, sheet metal, uh, with a number of sockets, valve holders, fixed to it, in which these, the vacuum tubes, the thermionic valves from those old days, plug in. Here is one, an EF91 in this case, um, which are the forerunners of transistors, which of course permeate all modern electronics. This is what was used in the 1940s and earlier. But it's useful to look at the other side of this. Uh, the valves that are on the top of the panel are interconnected here with many passive components, capacitors, which enable you to transfer signals from one place to another, resistors here and there which are used for converting current to voltage and vice versa some very large capacitors for smoothing out the power supplies there's a transformer here connected to the mains and that provides six volts at 15 amps for the heaters of these vacuum tubes the valves along here there's some screened compartments at the end here which has got similar electronics in here, but it, which is particularly sensitive to having picking up signals and radiating signals. And there, those circuits are put inside these metal compartments to screen them. So, we, we turn back to the front. And this chassis is fixed into a, a vertical rack, and there will be 13 others one stacked above each other in the rack, like shelves in a bookcase. This chassis uh, is actually used 43 times. That's fortunate because that's about a third of the machine. So that there's a good example that covers most of the machine. However, there are about 40 other designs of chassis with different layout of valves, different circuits underneath, different arrangement of these monitor points on the front and so on. Uh, and each, so each of those different chassis has its own functions. It might be storing two bits of information. It might be gating information together, this sort of thing. Each chassis has its own function. Now, our task is to determine what the functions are of all those chassis and what the circuits would be and do all the detailed design work to replicate that. The problem is that none of that information has come down to us from the past, except for some very good photographs. So, if, for example, if you look at the photographs of the rack with these 14 chassis in there, uh, if you magnify them enough and enough, you may see a little label stuck onto these two holes here. And you, with dint of a bit of imagination, it might say half adder or coincidence unit. And we know those functions are part of the overall structure of the machine. So there we've got a wonderful clue. It says half adder and we know the half adder is used somewhere in the main machine and we can look at the photograph and see all these vacuum tubes 
and see these connectors. That's all we can see, but we can see where they are. And from that, we can do a deduction about what are the detailed circuits that might support a half adder or coincidence unit or whatever. And, and that forensic work is tedious and painstaking and extraordinarily detailed. And you have to tackle it a little bit at a time. And as one part of the thing is solved, that will lead to clues to other parts. And, and that's the work which is currently ongoing. A number of volunteers are taking up particular bits of the, uh, of the circuitry, the chassis, and making the deductions that have to fit. First of all, the function that is required. I mean, we know what, the, what, what it has to do functionally. Uh, but also to do that and produce something which is authentically correct in appearance and in behaviour to 1949. Now, there are debates at this stage about when we can see that circuit is not very reliable. The, the, pres presumably the pioneers may have recognised that, but they didn't have time to fix it. They wanted to get on and make their machine. So they accepted an unreliable circuit on the grounds that if they could make the machine work, they could keep... keep tweaking this unreliable zone. Well, we don't want to jump and bypass there. We don't want to second guess what they did later. We want to replicate what it was like. So I'm sorry to say, we've got to accept this unreliable circuit and we've got to accept that we'll have to keep tweaking. We may, once the whole thing's working, change our view on that. But we've got to have a single view now that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. We're going to make it like it was in 1949 without improving it.